Hello, I'm Dr Imogen Tedbury. This is a lunchtime talk to launch my new book, which I wrote when I was the assistant curator at Royal Holloway College. Um, the book is supported by the Understanding British Portraits Network, to whom I am very grateful. In November 1925, a group of university educated women met together to commission a painting of this woman, who they called the Chief. This is Ellen Charlotte Higgins. And this portrait was to celebrate her 20th year as principal of Royal Holloway College. Like Bedford College and other early women's university colleges, Royal Holloway possessed a growing collection of portraits, commissioned to commemorate leaders, lecturers, principals and pioneers in women's education. They were commissioned by collectives of educated women, staff, students and alumni, and they were painted by some of the leading artists of the day. At a time when women's higher education was considered contentious, even dangerous, these paintings were symbols of institutional continuity, tradition and collective identity. When Royal Holloway College and Bedford College merged in 1985, their portrait collections came together and both collections reveal the intersection between the history of women's higher education and the development of modern portraiture. But the two collections are rather different and they reflect the college's differing attitudes to leadership, aspiration and women's education. Royal Holloway was founded by philanthropist Thomas Holloway in 1879 and opened by Queen Victoria in 1886. It was a wealthy college and students were assigned two rooms of their own in the college's palatial buildings for which they paid comparatively high fees as well as a generous endowment of £200,000, about nine and a half million today, and an impressive building inspired by 16th century Chateau de Chambord, Thomas Holloway also left the college, its collection of modern paintings hung in the college picture gallery, which you can see down here. Any commissioned portraits were, therefore, additions to the college's fine art collection, and this may well have set a deliberate agenda to commission portraits from famous artists. Bedford College was founded in a rather different circumstances. It was founded by Elizabeth Dessa Reed 30 years earlier, and it had a completely different ethos. The college was the first women's university level college in the UK, and it didn't conform con to contemporary conventions for university education, adopted by full-time residential colleges like Royal Holloway. Instead, its classes were open to non-resident students, fees were kept affordable, and there was no obligation to undertake degree-length study, which made it far more accessible. In 1878, Bedford students were among the first women to graduate after the University of London opened its degree examinations to women. Unlike some of the wealthier colleges, like Royal Holloway, for example, Bedford did not commission portraits of its founders and leaders until over 50 years after its foundation, though it did receive several portraits of early supporters and founders as gifts, and these hung on the walls at Bedford Square, York Place, and eventually Regent's Park. And I'll be showing you some of these portraits later. In the early days, both colleges, like many women's colleges, were governed predominantly by male boards of governors or college councils. Well-versed old Bedfordians who are watching will know the situation at Bedford was slightly more complicated and there were ladies trustees there, but in both cases, the structures in place effectively locked out female teaching staff from involvement in college governance. And in these circumstances, alumni associations and old students clubs became increasingly important Women who studied and taught at these colleges were connected to their alma mater for life and connected to other colleges through the networks of alumni working and living elsewhere. These collectives of staff, students and alumni played a key role in the portrait transaction, that is the negotiation between sitter, maker, conventions and commission. These portraits were intended, as well as depictions of the individual women themselves, they were also intended as commemorations of college history with each individual representing a passage of time. And whether collected or commissioned, these portraits construct a collective identity when they are hung together in their institutional context. Today, I'll share some of the research that went into this catalogue, which presents 14 portraits of 10 women painted between 1884 and 1952, a period in which women's higher education changed unrecognisably. Throughout, I'll consider the visibility of these portraits. They were collected and commissioned for these colleges, and the colleges were at once private art collections, intended for the edification of staff and students, but also public art collections, seen by visitors of all kinds, including alumni and prospective parents. 
As such, these portraits tread a deliberately fine line between tradition and innovation. College art collections were in some ways the visualisation of a college's radical agenda as a centre of women's education. Yet the artistic ambitions of old students' clubs and associations were, for the most part, rather conservative, reflecting the cautious attitudes of women in higher education more generally. Operating among widespread arguments that education could unsex women, that studying could drain maternal energy and cause infertility, educational reformers were extremely careful and cautious about social norms, even where portraiture was concerned. And this caution locked women into a kind of rigid mould of respectability, as Martha Vecinas had put it, when the women might have gained more by daring more. Portraits were a way to enshrine memory, history and tradition, a means to legitimise history to visitors and prospective students. And as a result, in the early days of women's higher education, artists were employed to paint portraits that had rather little to differentiate them from family portraits of the period. The first leaders of women's colleges, like Matilda Bishop, did not hold degrees themselves. This isn't surprising given that the University of London had only awarded degrees to women from 1878, and women in Oxford had to wait until 1920 and Cambridge until 1948. These women were appointed for their social connections, their experience as school teachers and their credentials as respectable, cultivated women capable of chaperoning the young women in their care. Religious affiliations were also important. Some women's colleges were founded as Anglican, some as Evangelical, and others, like Bedford and Royal Holloway, were non-denominational. Matilda Bishop was, rather appropriately for her name, very high church, and she actually resigned from the principalship in 1897 over a controversy around holding non-denominational services in the college chapel. That year, in 1897, the Royal Holloway College Alumni Association commissioned a portrait to celebrate Bishop's time as principal from society portrait painter James Jabusa Shannon. Shannon is an American artist, sometimes described as John Singer Sargent's most neglected rival, and he was a founder member of the New English Art Club. In the 1890s, Shannon was at the height of his fame. He was an associate of the Royal Academy, he lived next door to Frederick Lord Leighton in Holland Park, and he charged between £1,000 and £1,500 per portrait. That's between about eighty pounds to £100,000 today. To commission the paintings from Shannon in the 1890s signified a certain fashionableness, to say nothing of a certain wealth. Shannon's portrait of Bishop follows contemporary conventions for portraying upper and middle class women. She is seated in a tastefully simple interior. Distinctive wooden panelling and this particular chair appear elsewhere in Shannon's portraits and this suggests the bishop probably sat for her portrait at Shannon's studio at 8 South Bolton Gardens, right next door to Lord Leighton. Bishop looks up at the viewer and I think this viewpoint softens her jawline rather compared to those photos I'll just show you again. She wears an elaborate black satin tea gown decorated with pale blue flowers Shannon's bravura brushstroke details a kind of froth and flounce in her dress and the large puffed sleeves and frothy neckline wouldn't have looked out of place um, in any drawing room at the time. This portrait exemplifies Shannon's unique fusion of technical innovation, the broken brushstroke of impressionism, limited tonal range favoured by Whistler and Bastien Lepage, with the traditions of English portraiture works by Reynolds, Romney and Lawrence that were having a real moment of revival in the last decades of the 19th century. And this revival of taste for these paintings um, seems to have struck Shannon and made his work more popular. And his work was actually exhibited alongside some of these English forebears in an exhibition at the New Gallery in the 1890s. So this winning combination of innovation and tradition made Shannon extremely popular with the conservative clubs and associations of the early women's colleges, who clearly communicated and took inspiration from each other's portraits. So here I'm showing you a group which, as you can see, includes Matilda Bishop. But before painting her for Royal Holloway, Shannon had already undertaken four portraits of Newnham College's uh, founders and first principals, um, which hang in the dining hall at Newnham. And later, we would add to these um, a portrait of Dame Elizabeth Wordsworth, the first principal of Lady Margaret Hall in Oxford. Um, and he went on to paint Emily Michaelis, the first principal of Froebel College in 1899. And then also Dorothy Beale, the founder and first principal of St Hilda's College in Oxford in 1902. 
All of these portraits share very similar dimensions and they are similarly conservative in style. You can imagine seeing these in a family home as well as in a dining hall of a university college. These fashionable yet conservative paintings of respectable and feminine women were hung where you could see them when you visited. And here you can see a bishop's portrait hanging on the walls at Royal Holloway. Um, I love this because you can actually see Emily Penrose uh, on the left here. This is Emily Penrose, if you can see my cursor, sitting at a high table. And then on the right, you can see Newnham College Dining Hall um, with the founders' portraits hanging there, where they still hang today. And so in these settings, these paintings were visible not only to staff and students, but also to college visitors, whether that includes prospective parents, prospective students, um, visitors from other colleges um, in Oxbridge. Everyone would have been able to see these portraits and they, I'm sure, would have been a great point of discussion. Portraiture as propaganda was far less of a priority at Bedford College. Unlike some of the wealthier women's colleges, Bedford College did not commission portraits of its founders and leaders until over 50 years after its foundation, as I have said already. But this was partly because the college didn't actually appoint a principal until 1893. The earliest surviving portrait of a Bedford College principal is this lovely pastel of the second principal Ethel Hellbat by Bedford alumna and artist Ida Rose Morley. It dates from 1906. And you can see here, I hope, uh, the portrait hanging over the fireplace in the common room at York Place. We found this photograph recently and it seems to have been taken on the same day that uh, Helbert was posing for her portrait, which is uh, rather lovely to see. You'll notice on the walls of the, uh, of the students' common room um, also a number of reproductions. And I, I'm sure that in this corner, you can just about make out Watts's Hope, very famous. Um, if anyone can see any of those other, those other paintings are, do let me know. Uh, we think they might also be reproductions of Watts's work, which seems to have been very popular with the students. Before 1906, however, the college was the recipient of several portraits depicting figures who were significant to the early life of the college. And here I'm showing you two of these women. Council member and pioneering local politician Henrietta Busk, painted by Percy Bigland, another member of the English Art Club, and on the right, Anna Swanick, a respected scholar of ancient Greek and German, who became the college's first female visitor, a very prestigious lecture post. Swanick's signature had been on the suffrage petition presented by John Stuart Mill to Parliament in 1866. And these portraits served as inspirational images and reminders of the Bedford community's pioneering role in the women's education movement. Most notable, most, most notable among these portraits of inspirational women is the newly identified portrait of Millicent Garrett Fawcett, leading suffragist and figurehead of the movement for women's education. Until recently, this portrait was thought to be a painting of Emily Penrose, the pioneering educationalist who was the first principal of Bedford College before becoming the principal of Royal Holloway College and then Somerville College. And this portrait has a, a plaque on its frame that describes it as such. It says Emily Penrose, first principal of Bedford College. But during research for this catalogue, I identified a signature in the lower right corner of the canvas as that of Theodore Blake Workman, an artist and illustrator from a family of Swedish and British intellectuals. And several months later, Alison Wright, then the art collections catalogue, I found a reference to a portrait by Workman given to Bedford College in 1899. But you can see here, the portrait isn't listed as a portrait of uh, Penrose, it was listed as a portrait of Millicent Fawcett. And this was then confirmed um, by the then assistant curator finding uh, this illustration in the Royal Academy Illustrated Catalogue from 1898, um, where the painting was exhibited as a portrait of Mrs. Henry Fawcett. We can see from the archive reference that this portrait became a gift to the college in 1899. It was a gift from Dorothy Roberts, who was an Irish industries campaigner and suffragist and an old friend of Fawcett. She describes her as such in her autobiography. Workman, the artist, was married to Robert's niece, which seems to have led to this commission. Millicent Garrett Fawcett is of course best known today as a leading suffragist and campaigner, most notably as a president of the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies. However, she was also a passionate advocate for women's access to education. 
Fawcett co-founded Newnham College, Cambridge in 1875. And she lectured on higher education for women across the UK. She was also part of the extended community of advisors to Bedford College. Her daughter Philippa attended chemistry classes at Bedford in the 1880s and Fawcett herself was a visiting lecturer at the college where she spoke on the subject of women's higher education in 1886, 1897 and 1899, the year that this portrait was given to the college. Fawcett was also a very important symbolic figure at Bedford uh, as in 1899 she became one of the first women to be awarded an honorary doctoral degree in the UK. She received her LLD from the University of St Andrews that year and the conferral of this degree was a cause for great celebration among the suffrage and women's education movements. Women's higher education was still a really controversial subject at the time um, and it's it's shocking to think that it was just two years earlier in 1897 that Cambridge University had rejected a proposal to grant women formal recognition of their degrees. So women had been at the university for 20 years already, um, but the men, uh, yeah, the men um, uh, voted by 1713 votes against 662 um, that women should not have uh, their degrees formally recognised. This image here shows you the crowds gathered um, to see the results of this vote on King's Parade in 1897. Um, and Millicent Fawcett gave a, a speech about women's higher education at Bedford um, very soon after this vote, uh, seemingly in response to it, though she doesn't explain, she doesn't make it the focus of her, of her speech. Wegman's portrait of Fawcett was painted the following year in 1898. Um, when she was still uh, not quite um, a doctor. And it shows a quite a more introspective side to a woman who is usually presented as a great campaigner. From Renaissance depictions of St. Jerome onwards, scholars at work have often been presented as solitary thinkers in a study-like environment, book in hand, isolated from the world. And we interrupt Fawcett in a similar setting in this portrait. Her heart-shaped face, simply styled auburn hair and fine bone structure give her rather a youthful appearance and she's dressed in a simple style that was favoured by female students and scholars at the end of the 19th century. While Roberts's gift of Fawcett's portrait to Bedford College was probably motivated by the degree conferral that year or perhaps the speech that she had recently given at the college, there is no doubt that giving and displaying portraits of individuals associated with the suffrage movement was a relatively progressive gesture. Portraits of women such as Busk, Swanick and Fawcett also provided alternative models of success to the galleries and founders of academic leaders as displayed in the other women's colleges. Instead, these portraits map a wider network of supporters and alumni than just the college principals. By hanging paintings of these figures on their walls, Bedford College set these women as inspiration to their students, demonstrating that women could do important work outside of academia as well as within it. In the 1890s, women's colleges began to hire a new kind of principal. Women intellectuals who were among the first generation of women to study at university and then go on to teach there. Despite their qualifications, this second generation of principals and indeed many lecturers at, lecturers at women's colleges did not have the time or freedom to conduct their own research alongside their pastoral and teaching duties. And Emily Penrose's case really exemplifies this. She was a classical scholar, the first woman to attain a first in the great classics at Oxford. And in her distinguished career as principal of Bedford, Royal Holloway and then Somerville, she sat on the administrative boards of the universities of London and Oxford. And we should credit her for, for the very big role in, in getting women their degrees at Oxford in 1920. She was unusually tall and rather shy and awkward with a lack of small talk that terrified students at the dining table. Um, and she, she really seems to prefer the company of her books, but also the company of her watercolours. And here I'm showing you one of her watercolours that she made when she was living with her father in Athens. Her father um, was the head of the British school in Athens, and she lived there with him for a time before going up to Somerville. When Penrose left Royal Holloway to become the principal of Somerville in 1907, the college commissioned her portrait from Philip de Laszlo who had just arrived in London earlier that year and was already beginning to make a name for himself as Singer Sargent's successor. 
he was probably recommended to paint Penrose by Vice Principal Elizabeth Maud Guinness here on the left. Um, Guinness was his wife's cousin and they, yes, they are both Guinnesses um, descended from the, the family of the bank. Um, and uh, Guinness was also painted by de Laszlo for Royal Holloway when she left the university um, three years after Penrose did. There are two known sketches which survive for de Laszlo's portrait of Emily Penrose. A portrait drawing given by de Laszlo to Penrose as a Christmas present, so it would seem from this inscription, and an oil sketch now at Royal Holloway, which plans out the composition's colours, balancing dark and bright blue tones. And de Lasso employed a similar palette for his portrait of Guinness. Um, you can see she's wearing a rather sombre black dress, but with highlights of real electric blue, uh, and those sort of come through in her hat as well, that deep, deep blue. And these complement uh, the, the blue of Penrose's, um, uh, the lining of Penrose's academic hood. And as a pendant pair, which seems to have been how de Laszlo conceived of them, certainly when he painted uh, Guinness, these portraits present two models of educated women. Penrose, the scholarly academic, clad in her university gown, but also Guinness as the cultured intellectual, elegantly and fashionably dressed. And there are all these fabulous um, stories from uh, old students talking about how intimidating Guinness was as she wafted down the corridor smelling of scent, looking like she was on her way to the opera. Penrose's academic costume and Guinness's lack thereof do attest to a rather complicated situation that was still going on regarding women, their degrees and their academic dress at this time. By this point, academic dress worn by women had become aspirational. In May 1907, for example, a group of Somerville students requested that the principal and members of staff who were entitled to wear academic dress should do so at Sunday prayers. And yet many of the women who had attained the most prestigious results at university examinations were not permitted to wear academic, drove, uh, academic dress, or certainly not that of their alma mater. Royal Holloway students could receive degrees from the University of London, which had opened its degrees in 1878 to women, but many Royal Holloway students, including Elizabeth Guinness, elected to take the examination set by Oxford, which, like Cambridge, didn't recognise women as graduates. And Penrose herself had not received a degree from the University of Oxford, nor permission to wear the distinctive black hood with crimson lining worn by Oxford graduates. However, in 1904, a Trinity College Dublin opened its degrees to women. And at that time, it also offered women, uh, to, uh, women who had completed courses at Oxbridge colleges, the opportunity to come over to Dublin to receive their degrees. And this was all started by one woman, and one woman who requested this um, as, I think, an Oxford graduate. And Trinity said, sure, and we'll find, um, we'll, we'll open it up to other women as well. Um, why not? And then there was this influx between 1904 and 1907. 720 women travelled to Dublin by steamboat to attend graduation ceremonies and receive their hood lined with blue before Trinity College then revised their policy because they were overwhelmed with the numbers of these uh, women who became known as the Steamboat Ladies and this is a, a group of the Steamboat Ladies seen here. De Laszlo um, famously really liked to paint his sitters wearing the garb of their rank and so he painted Penrose wearing the hood and gown of the Steamboat Ladies, a costume that denotes Penrose's status as a graduate if not as a graduate of Oxford. After Oxford opened its degrees in 1920, however, largely thanks to Penrose's efforts at Somerville, Penrose finally received her degree um, from Oxford um, at the first degree ceremony to include female graduates, which was held in October 2020. At October 1920, October 2020 marks 100 years since the first degree ceremony, and Oxford have actually launched a fantastic new resource exploring this, um, if you want to know more about this, this moment in Oxford's history. Aside from the difficulties surrounding the acquisition of academic dress, there was also the question of how such ceremonial clothing should be worn. Specifically, what should women wear underneath their university gowns? The simple dress worn by many of the, these pioneering women was a form of academic self-fashioning, indicating a serious mindset and a lack of frivolity. However, the sartorial trend for androgynous dressing also coexisted with more feminine fashions, which many women still preferred. Penrose being one of them. In his portrait of Penrose, de Lasso develops a new kind of portrait, a portrait that reconciles academic with feminine dress. 
she wears her university hood askew across her upper body like a sash, perhaps alluding to the drapery worn of classical portrait busts. She's presented as a visionary, gazing into the distance in a manner that recalls neoclassical depictions of muses or allegorical figures. Uh, and I, I think there's an interesting comparison to be made here, um, thanks to Tom Stammers for this connection, um, with the portraits of intellectual women in the 18th century blue stocking circle who were drawn on similar sources. And de Laszlo would have known uh, Pine's portrait of Catherine Macaulay, which was given to the National Portrait Gallery in 1904. So just three years before he painted Penrose. After painting Penrose, this new kind of portrait invented by de Laszlo, or invented by de Laszlo after uh, the portraits of the blue stockings, um, this, this became a particular specialism of his, and he seems to have received a number of commissions to paint other pioneering professional women in the first decades of the 20th century. And this is just a selection of a number of portraits that I could show you, um, but I, it gives you a real sense of the way that his ideas are developing and the way that he um, kind of explores how academic hoods can be worn over different kinds of clothing and different kinds of poses. And they take on this very um, royal, very elegant quality, um, some of them. Like Penrose, quite a few of these portraits um, show women wearing the particular um, hoods worn by the steamboat ladies, so other women who had gone over to Trinity to get their degrees. And the number of these paintings suggests that de Laszlo gained a real reputation for this kind of work and how they commissioned these portraits. In de Laszlo's new portraits of new women, academic robes, worn and painted, became agents of a new kind of female authority. And I think there's something interesting to be said here for how inspirational these portraits may have been. The fact that these women don't look like blue stockings, they do look rather glamorous. Um, and that, uh, I think, makes them quite iconic uh, in, a, in a different way to some of, the, um, some of the other portraits we'll look at in a minute, like this one. Um, and I think this portrait, for me, really represents some of the difficulties of the painter's task in representing these thinking women. Uh, this is, I think, slightly less successful um, as an example in the Royal Holloway and Bedford New College collection. This is a portrait of Dame Margaret Duke, the longest serving principal of Bedford College, commissioned in 1913 to commemorate the college's move to its new buildings in Regent's Park, a move that Duke had been responsible for leading. Reginald Eaves was by, chosen by Tuke herself to undertake the commission. In 1914, Eaves was still making a name for himself, but he would go on to become a very important portrait painter, particularly for his work employed by the War Artists Advisory Committee in the Second World War. But at this date, he was still making a name for himself, and he seems to have been chosen for rather practical reasons, as his studio was very close to Bedford College's new premises. Eves accepted the invitation to paint Duke, writing that he would very much enjoy it, and a portrait of this kind was very attractive to him. And he painted it for less than his usual fee of 300 guineas, as long as some secrecy was maintained as to the price. Didn't want anyone knowing that he was doing cut price rates. Subscriptions initially raised £155, which paid for the presentation portrait on the left, and then further donations enabled the committee to purchase Eves' sketch in preparation for the, the portrait. This was given as a gift to Tuke herself, who duly presented this second portrait to the college. So for many decades at Bedford College, you would have, as a student, you would have been able to walk around and see both representations of Tuke hanging on the walls um, in different spaces in the college. In these paintings, Tuke wears the blue lined hood and black gown that indicates her status as one of the steamboat ladies, like Penrose. Tuke had attended classes at Bedford College one day a week during the Michaelmas term of 1879, but she'd really studied at Newnham College, Cambridge, um, where she gained a first in modern and medieval languages, though no degree, of course. Here, her hood is slightly askew, and the loose brush stroke draws attention to the movement of the folds and pleats of her gown, and that merges rather with the murky interior behind her. But with her very high white collar and her simply arranged hair, and this um, tie, green Bedford green tie and waistcoat, um, these, all these elements contribute to a real impression of masculinity, I think. I think we, we can say that. Neither of these paintings were universally well received by the college community at Bedford. And in fact, Professor X noted that Tuke herself 
disliked these portraits. And this was perhaps the reason why she gave the sketch to the college instead of keeping it in her house. Neither of them pleased very many people at all. So in 1934, when Duke was elected as a fellow of Bedford after her retirement, um, Bedford decided to replace this unsatisfactory painting, um, a word used in the correspondence about this painting, and advice was, sought, advice was sought from staff and alumni to find an artist who would paint something appropriate and affordable. This proved tricky as the amount of money raised by subscription was rather low and their first choice artist, Gerald Kelly, rejected the commission for this reason. Philippa Fawcett and Ida Rose Morley noted that whoever the artist was going to be, it was important to get old students to talk to Duke while her portrait was being painted, as her expression varies so much when she is animated. That the sort of idea which comes up in the correspondence that Duke really looks very different um, when she's still to when she's talking, and they needed something very skillful to capture this vivacity that she has. Several correspondents suggested Francis Dodd, um, who had done rather a fine portrait drawing um, for the Bedford College Student Association of uh, one of the lecturers. Portrait drawings were a real specialism of Dodd's, and this medium was less expensive than painting. As a result of all of these suggestions, Francis Dodd was appointed, but at Duke's request, he made a painted portrait and not a portrait drawing, as several people had requested. This portrait is very interesting. It's painted on panel, a medium used before the increased popularity of canvas supports in the 16th century. And it's also framed in an 18th century Italian cassetta frame, which the artist seems to have sourced himself. And I'm really sorry I don't have a picture of this to show you. It's not that interesting as a frame, but the impulse to try and find an old frame, old Italian frame for this painting, I think is rather interesting. The format is particularly appropriate for Duke who had studied, as I said, modern and medieval languages. And she later gave Bedford College Library a group of 16th century Italian manuscripts. And she seems to have, a particular, have had a particular interest in Italy. Um, the sitter's fur collar and the green background, the parapet and scroll um, with the signature in the front, which has Dodd's, um, Dodd's signature. These all, all these elements really pastiche Venetian painting around 1500. It's not, um, a particular, he's not leaning particularly heavily on any particular artist, although he does seem to be particularly interested in Lorenzo Lotto, um, we can see from some of his other work, um, but this is, this is really pastiche here, I think. Examination under ultraviolet light undertaken during conservation treatment um, also reveals that some of the final details of this, um, some of the uh, zigzag brushstrokes um, and details in the jewellery and the hands. Um, these were added after the painting was varnished, probably by the artist. And I would like to speculate that this could have happened um, when the painting was exhibited at the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition in 1934, where Francis Dodd reported, the little lady held her own among the other portraits, uh, which I think is rather revealing of Dodd's attitude to um, this particular commission. Um, this is only speculation, um, of course. After the painting was finished, um, Dodd sold the college his preparatory drawing for the portrait um, for £21. So this is the kind of work that the, the students and alumni had initially thought that they were going to get. And I think this is rather more successful. It, it shows an earlier stage in the, the painted portraits planning before the marble ledge was added to the composition. Um, and I think it, it captures something of the movement in her face in a way that the, the painting doesn't. When the painting was unveiled at Bedford College, opinion was really divided as to the strength of its likeness of Duke again. Um, and the chairman of council, Sir Wilmot Herringham, gave a speech that attempted to excuse the painting against its critics, while also damning it with faint praise. He said, I have heard it said that some are not so well satisfied with the picture as a likeness. But no two people see exactly the same things in the face of a friend or are quite agreed upon likeness. And portraits are valued chiefly not for the exact likeness, but for other qualities of composition and of technical mastery. Such reactions, I think, really attest to the expectations of a rather conservative audience um, at this date. And the search for an appropriate portrait painter who would capture likeness had become increasingly complex over the decades as the traditional tastes of commissioning collectives of women at universities did not always get met by the kinds of works produced by leading portrait painters of the day. 
And in the 1920s and 1950s, women's college networks commissioned paintings from artists like James Gunn, James Gunn and David Jagger. And Gunn in particular had a, a, was hugely popular with the women's colleges, like Shannon and DeLaslo. He painted a number of portraits for Bedford, Lady Margaret Hall, Newnham and others. And these commissions, I think, demonstrate that women's colleges and their alumni associations still saw portraits as a means to demonstrate stability and tradition well into the 1950s. That impulse towards conservatism kind of still sticking around. The final portrait um, I want to show you today is Sir William Orpin's portrait of Ellen Higgins, where we began, um, which I think exemplifies the genre of portraiture at its absolute finest. Higgins was the longest serving principal of Royal Holloway College, where she was also an undergraduate. As a student, she won numerous prizes and uniquely um, attained first class in both maths at Oxford and English uh, at, at the University of London. And she taught maths for several years before returning to Royal Holloway as the principal in 1907. She was the successor to Emily Penrose. Um, when she was a senator of the University of London, she blocked an attempt to expel Royal Holloway from the university because of its geographical remoteness. And she was beloved by her students, who called her the chief, and she wasn't averse to taking part in elaborately costumed college plays, as this photo of the chief as a wizard attests. On her retirement, a colleague described her as the Scottish chief of manly mean, of words directly fired, resolved yet reasonable, firm but kind. This painting of the chief was commissioned in 1925 from uh, Sir William Orpen, and this was paid for by subscriptions from students, staff and alumni at the RHCA. It was unveiled at an elaborate ceremony in 1927. Orpen was, of course, one of the most successful portrait painters of the 1920s, and the prices he charged for his portraits increased incrementally over that decade. Occasionally, he would agree to paint a portrait for a lower fee, as was the case with this portrait of Higgins for Royal Holloway. He agreed to paint this for £500 plus £48, 10 shillings for the frame. And this, this is a real cut because Orpen usually charged £1,500 for a three quarter length portrait of this size um, and with this level of uh, detail, this inclusion of hands. De Laszlo and probably Shannon too pro also charged the college cut price rates but I think we should note that when we talk about these artists giving discounts they're still charging a substantial amount of money. Um, £548 10 shillings approximates to about £22,500 today and to spend this kind of money on portraits I think really signals Royal Holloway's pride in its history as an institution uh, but it's, it's, pride as a, it's pride in its artistic heritage in particular, exemplified by the picture gallery and its fine art collection. And interestingly, uh, Royal Holloway's curator, uh, William, uh, Charles William Carey, seems to have chosen to hang some of these portraits in the picture gallery on occasion, as well as the dining hall. Some of they would have been seen alongside Turner and Gainsborough and Constable. Very interesting. Surviving correspondence from Orpen in the Royal Holloway archives indicates that Higgins like Bishop before her, had travelled to Orpen's studio at South Bolton Gardens to sit for her portrait. And interestingly, James Jabusa Shannon had actually worked in the same studio as Orpen previously, so Higgins even visited the same building that Matilda Bishop had nearly 30 years earlier. Orpen did not visit Egham during the course of his commission. Instead, he asked for details of the portrait's intended location in the college dining hall. A small sketch in this letter illustrates his, re his request for information about the direction of the light. You can see here the arrows, left light, left light or right light. How should he paint her in the studio? Alban's personal correspondence is full of drawings and caricatures, and he also used thumbnail sketches of this kind to record the composition of certain paintings in his account book. And despite this small size, I think this image reveals some of Orpen's assumptions about the commission before he had even met Higgins. He seemed to imagined, have imagined a half-length portrait of a woman with rather elaborate hair, maybe something a bit like this portrait of Evelyn Marshall Field. But of course, the finished portrait of um, the chief is rather different. Three-quarter length, standing just over a metre wide. And so we see her on the same near lifelike scale um, as Shannon's portrait of Bishop and De Laszlo's portrait of Penrose, which Higgins would have known she was going to be um, hanging alongside. And standing erect with her hand on her hip, holding her mortarboard in this stance, she really evokes a military or royal portraits. 
Uh, and this, I mean, I'm showing you this example here of a portrait of George IV, um, possibly after a, a lost painting by Reynolds. Uh, but I could be showing you any number of royal portraits here, um, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, here, uh, Higgins is wearing her University of London MA Arts hood, this sort of russet toned, uh, russet lined hood over her black gown. And she's wearing those over one of her rather famously masculine outfits. You can see here her um, rather interesting belt, uh, which is possibly a kind of a graduation gift of some kind, uh, and some nice sort of other details like the glint on her tie pin. Uh, these, these clothes were very characteristic for Higgins. According to one alumna, she had asked Worth to design her a suitable outfit for her role as principal, and she wore suits made from his design with masculine jacket and long skirt until her retirement in 1935, by which point these clothes would have been really well out of fashion. William Alpin preferred to paint his subjects seated and went out of his way to persuade subjects that sitting conveyed a much finer effect, provided they could sit still. And he got into some scrapes about this, whether you could paint a full length portrait of someone if they were sitting down. So Higgins' standing stance is extremely unusual um, among his work. And I've only found a couple of other paintings that show people standing up, um, a couple of other portraits, society portraits showing people standing up. And I think it's almost certainly an element of the portrait that Higgins insisted upon herself, perhaps with reference to de Laszlo's portrait of Penrose. And I, I just want to show you here, this is a picture of Orpin's studio at South Bolton Gardens, and you can see that chair on the little stage there, so the, the kind of prominence of the chair and of the seating um, to his, his artistic practice. But Higgins, knowing this portrait uh, by de Laszlo, may well have insisted on standing herself. And in this way, artists and sitter forged a new kind of portraiture together, drawing on existing conventions and inventing new ones. For Orpen, these sittings or standings were moments for a real lively exchange. Um, he advocated getting people to talk. And if you didn't talk, um, then all you got was a, a construction of bone and flesh. But when you get them to talk, you get life in the face, animation and human feeling. We can only imagine the conversations that took place between Orpen, who's famously sardonic and provocative, and Higgins, known for being very brusque and direct. But I think it's clear from this portrait that they got on pretty well. And this portrait does successfully capture both her authority and her lightness of touch. The portraits discussed in this catalogue and in this talk, um, present a chronology of achievement and progress at two of the first women's university colleges in the UK. But while these portraits undoubtedly express some personality, the steadfast gaze, twinkle in the eye, the constraints of this commission and the context make these glimpses of personality a fictional construct of sorts, I think. As a series, and this, I should say, is a, a fictional series I'm showing you here. This is a mixture of Royal Holloway and Bedford College. Um, the series we would now put together today at Royal Holloway and Bedford New College. As a series, these paintings commemorate the passage of time. Each woman represents a different chapter, chapter in their college's respective histories. Um, and one as one lecturer remarked, in the Jubilee year of 1937, the college is Miss Higgins and Miss Higgins the college. Dressed in the garments that signify their authority through academic achievement, these painted figures are intended to be inspirational. Symbols of achievement, history, but also future expectation. What would the undergraduates looking at these portraits go on to be? Over the last months, there has been much discussion about representations on the walls of our institutions and the ways in which we can actively demonstrate our commitment to eradicating inequality through the artworks we choose to surround ourselves with. And during this period, I thought a lot about the young women who studied at Royal Holloway and Bedford in the early days, who would have lived their student lives alongside these images of women graduates. One of these women was my grandmother, who studied under the chief in the 1920s. And she's actually the, the woman smoking on the far right of this photo here, the pointing finger and her voting blazer draped over the back of her chair. Returning to my old college in Cambridge recently, I was struck by the absence of women on the walls there. And I realised that my grandmother in the 1920s was surrounded by better visuals for women's academic success than I was in the 2000s. As we reconsider who we choose to celebrate and why, I like to think of these pioneering women 
sitters, patrons and viewers who knew the power of images to inspire and reassure. And I hope that this project goes some way to bring a new light to these women, without whom about half of us wouldn't be where we are today. Thank you very much for watching. If you want to find out more about this project, there are some links here on this page. You can see the online exhibition of these portraits and you can also order the catalogue or soon order the catalogue from Art UK. Thank you very much.